or a young girl, 14-year-old girl in Rockville, where I uh, took uh, our son Joel to uh, Boys National Tennis Tournament when he was 16, uh, two years in a row. Rockville, Maryland High School, allegedly raped by two illegal immigrants, 17 and 18 years old. I think it was the same day that a terrorist uh, mowed down uh, people on Westminster Bridge, right close to the parliament, uh, injuring or killing four, injuring 40. And then he got out of the truck and stabbed a police officer to death. Same day, 12 people were killed in Chicago. I thought, you know, and then this last week, people killed with sarin gas in Syria. I think, what's going on? Seems like the world is spinning more and more out of control. Why? The Apostle Paul says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Isaiah says, for we all, like sheep, have turned away, as turned astray. Without God, who is the source of all good, if we turn away from Him, things get progressively worse in this world. God saw our problem and sent his son into the world to die for our sins. Jesus' death on the cross for all sins is the greatest act of love this world has ever seen. I'd like to look at you with, uh, at how Jesus' death on the cross was the greatest act of love. I want to look at Mark's account in Mark chapter 15. If you want to follow along in the Bibles we have under the seats in front of you, it's going to be on page 1021. I want to make three reflections about why Jesus' death on the cross for all sins is the greatest act of love the world has ever seen. First, Jesus' death on the cross was no accident. Some people say, isn't it horrible what happened to Jesus? I mean, if only Judas hadn't betrayed him. If only Pilate had had guts to not turn Jesus over to be crucified. They make it sound as if it was an accident. Jesus told his disciples before it happened. Mark 10, we are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him, and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Uh, the cross did not catch Jesus by surprise. He knew he came to earth to die for the sins of the world. After Jesus' death and resurrection, Peter is preaching in Jerusalem. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Uh, Peter says that Christ's death on the cross was foreordained, foreplanned by God. What does this mean? This means Jesus planned his own sacrifice. It wasn't the Jewish soldiers or uh, leaders or Romans who killed Jesus. He gave his life. His death was a fulfillment of uh, prophecies made centuries before. John writes about Jesus' crucifixion. I find this fascinating. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. So it's Jesus and two thieves. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man, who'd been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bro bones will be broken. Now, if you're a student of the Old Testament, you know that one of God's instructions in concerning the Passover lamb was that none of the bones can be broken. Uh, the, the lamb had to be perfect. And you also know that the uh, Passover was pointing toward 
the Messiah's suffering and death. Uh, to be the perfect sacrificial lamb, Jesus had to fulfill all of God's requirements. And one is that the lamb's bones not be broken. Our Lord, our Lord was the perfect lamb of God. His legs were not broken in fulfillment of Scripture. It was not by chance that the soldiers did not break Jesus' legs. This was pre-planned by God. So call Christ's death tragic, call it God's gift to humankind, but don't call it an accident. It wasn't an accident. He did it out of love. Second, Jesus' death on the cross involved all of us. Matthew 15, verse 16. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews. This is just sarcasm. Again and again they struck him. What's going on here? As far as I'm aware, the Romans don't have any beef with Jesus. It's the Jewish leaders that want him dead. Why are the Romans mocking him? They hit his head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on, the knee, on their knees, they paid homage to him. Why are the Romans doing this? It makes no sense. Mark wants us to see that Christ's death for cross on the cross was for all of us. We all put him to death. Romans, Jews, Greeks. Everyone was piling on. Just watch. Mark 15, verse 25. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, so, these are passers-by. Just people walking by. So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross, save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. We expect the, the Jewish religious leaders to mock him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, the King of Israel, come down now that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. All kinds of people piled on. Thieves, passers-by, Sadducees, Pharisees, Romans. What kind of people mock a dying man? I mean, why hurl insults at a person laced with pain? Would someone be so perverted as to make fun of someone seated in an electric chair? Mark's point is that all kinds of people joined in the abuse, even though they had no dog in the fight. Abandon. It's such a haunting word. On the edge of town lies a small, decrepit house. Weeds grow up over the porch. Plywood is boarded up, boarding up the windows. The front porch door swings in the wind. On the fence, is a, a sign is attached, abandoned. Nobody wants this house, not even the poor. A woman carries a six-year-old girl into an orphanage. The girl sits wide-eyed in the office of the director looking around. She hears the word abandoned. She was abandoned. A wife reads the email of her husband, romantic email to another woman. A woman sits in a retirement home on, uh, at Christmas. No cards, no carols, no calls. A guy that's worked 30 years for a factory finds a termination notice taped to his locker. 
abandoned by a spouse, abandoned by family, abandoned by big business. But nothing compares to being abandoned by God. Mark writes, at noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. Can you imagine that? Totally dark, the middle of the day. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus cries out, why have you abandoned me? Jesus was abandoned by everyone. One person said to me, Ron, do you believe that if you were the only one on earth that Jesus would have died for you? I said, I think so. Then, if you were the only one, who would have driven the nails into Jesus' hands? <laughs> well, that's a good question. I guess I would have. You would have. We all would have. Some ask, why did Jesus die on the cross? I mean, Hebrew says, there's no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. So we understand why he shed his blood, but why the cross? John says that Jesus was the perfect Lamb of God sent for the sins of the world. So we understand why he sacrificed himself, but why on the cross? Crucifixion was introduced by the Romans. It was the most terrible and gruesome form of execution. Why would God have his son die in this particular way? I mean, even the Apostle Paul was permitted to die by a nice, neat slice of the sword. Why did Jesus die in the worst possible way? I think the point is that God sent his son at this time of history when Romans had introduced crucifixion. Crucifixion was specifically designed to be the worst of the worst. It was so bad, Roman citizens didn't talk about it. Just like we don't like to talk about death or sin. The Romans avoided talking about crucifixion because it was so obscene. It was so disgusting. Why this form of death and not another? I think it's because it, it corresponds to the depth of our depravity. It shows how bad our rebellion is against God. No wonder we don't want to look at the cross. Jesus died on the cross to show the depth of our sin. He died for all the sins of the world. Our sins were on his shoulder. So in that sense, we were there with him. We were nailing him to the cross. Even though we put him to death, he went ahead with it because he loves us. Third, Jesus' death on the cross expresses God's love and forgiveness for all of us. All our sins placed Jesus on the cross. But thank God, his forgiveness is big enough for all of us. One of the thieves uh, put on the cross next to Jesus mocked him. The other criminal rebuked him, the other criminal. Don't you fear God? Since you were under the same sentence, we're punished justly. For we're getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. If you need proof that God loves you just the way you are, and that it's never too late to ask forgiveness, here it is. Jesus forgave a man who probably had never done anything for him, and certainly in the future could never do anything for him. I mean, forgiving the, the Samaritan woman, I can understand. She could go and tell everybody in her town. Helping Jairus, the important Jewish official, I get that. He could tell other Jews, Jewish religious leaders. 
healing the centurion's son? That makes sense. He could tell other Romans. But why help this thief on the cross? What could he do for Jesus? And that's the point. God's grace does not depend on anything you can do for him. Your worth to God does not depend on how rich you are, how well known, how influential you might be. You have value simply because God made you. He died because we couldn't save ourselves. In August of 1987, Flight 255, Northwest Airlines, went down shortly after taking off from Detroit International Airport. Subsequently, Northwest was bought by uh, Delta Airlines. There was only 200, 155 people died and only one survivor, a little four-year-old girl named Cecilia. She was in such good shape that rescuers wondered if she'd been on the flight. Maybe she was in one of the cars that was hit. But her name was on the manifest. We'll probably know never know exactly what happened, but they found this little girl with her mother's arms wrapped around her. Apparently her mother, Paula Sitchin, unbuckled her seatbelt and got around and knelt in front of her daughter, holding her in her arms to break the fall for her. And so her daughter survived. That's what Jesus did for us. He died for us to break the fall. Like the mom on the plane, Jesus died in our place. He endured five rapid fire, unjust trials. One before Annas, Caiaphas, the Sanhedrin, that's like seven, it's like our Senate, 70 senators. One before Pilate and then Herod. And then a crucifixion. If any person ever deserved a shot at revenge, it was Jesus. Instead, he forgave. Hanging on the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. His heart wasn't filled with hate for what they did to him, for what we did to him. It was filled with love. He forgave them. He forgave us. He took the blame for us. The decision had been made. The troops had been deployed. Three million soldiers launched for an attack on Hitler's Atlantic Wall. D-Day began, and the responsibility for it lay squarely on the four-star general's shoulders, Dwight D. Eisenhower. The night before the attack, he went around um, among all the soldiers of the 101st Airborne, encouraging them as they were preparing their cockpits and their equipment. He spoke to them, and many of them were uh, young enough to be his sons, and he treated them like that. People said when the C-47s took off into the darkness, Eisenhower stood there with his hands deep in his pockets and his eyes filled with tears. Then he went back to his office and he sat down at his desk, took pen and paper, and he wrote a note that was to be delivered to the White House in the event of failure. He said, our efforts have failed. Our men did all that bravery and duty could be expected to do. Responsibility for this lies squarely on me. Very rare for a leader to do something like that. It could be argued that the bravest thing done that night was not done in a cockpit or a foxhole, but 
by Eisenhower behind his desk, taking the blame for the failure of his soldiers. I mean, some people will take credit for things they do. Most people would do that. Some people will take blame for others. But take blame for something that hasn't even happened yet? Rare courage. Because of that, Eisenhower is a hero. And that's what Jesus did. He took our sins on himself, so he is our Savior. Before our sins had been, per, uh, been done, before we were even born, he took our sins on himself and he forgave us. The crucifixion reminds us how much God loves us. The crucifixion reminds us that we are sinners. We recognize that Jesus died for our sins, and in that sense, we were there nailing him to the cross. The crucifixion keeps us humble. We realize how flawed we are without Jesus. It enables us to be honest and realistic about our faults and shortcomings. Uh, I, uh, InterVarsity staff person and author Becky Pippert tells about speaking at a women's retreat. It was mostly women that were well-to-do. The woman who introduced her was impeccably dressed. She was gracious and kind. Becky was talking about sin that day. And even though she knew that sin is universally true for all, all of us, she wondered how it could be relevant to these ladies. They seem so together, so beautiful. After she was done, the woman who introduced her came back up to release people to lunch, and she said, before lunch, I want to tell you something. Becky's talk about sin and how we tend to deny it has really moved me. As some of you know, we have sent our daughter to the finest uh, European boarding schools. But what you don't know, because I've never told anybody, and I've just come to accept, is that our daughter is a serious drug addict. I always said I didn't tell anybody because I was protecting her. But today I see that I'm really protecting my reputation. And so, I just want to tell you, I know I'm not a perfect mom. We don't have a perfect family. Maybe we look like we're pretty, pretty together. And we're not out of the woods yet. But I can tell you that God has been so real to me His grace in our lives has been so evident. And I know my Redeemer lives. She sat down. No one moved for about a minute. Then Becky watched as women began to turn to each other and share the deep pain in their lives. Tissues came out of purses. The crucifixion helps us be transparent about our problems. We have nothing to hide. We can admit that we don't have everything together. And we have ongoing battles with sin. The re crucifixion reminds us that we all have sinned and we continue to sin. Isn't it time to take down the facade? About yourself? with your mate, with your children, with your parents, your co-workers, your classmates, your fellow church attenders. Jesus' death on the cross for all sins is the greatest act of love the world has ever seen. Because of it, there's no need to hide. God would never have sent his son to endure such a horrible crucifixion if sin was not a huge problem that inflicts 
all of us. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. What a great act of love, the greatest you showed for us, and we thank you so much. We recognize that we've all sinned, and we need your forgiveness. And so we thank you for making that possible for us. If you're here today and you're not certain that you've asked Jesus to die or to uh, forgive your sins and ask him to come into your life, why don't you do this right now? I'm going to give you all just a few moments to, to pray. You can tell him that you believe in him and that you want him in your life. All of us, would you tell Jesus how grateful you are for dying for you and how that means you can be transparent with people? It's, it's an open story that we're sinners. We make mistakes. We don't have to hide it. Let's all pray. Thank you, God, for sending your son to die in our place. We are so grateful this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.